The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Boom. All right. Welcome to the Stoa, everyone. I am Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. And the Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this moment. And today uh, we have John Zerzan here. John is an anarchist and primitivist philosopher and a uh, critic on civilization itself. And he's the author of many books, uh, most recently, A People's History of Civilization. And how he came on my radar, I think I was like 17 or 18 or something, and uh, read this book, uh, Running on Emptiness, uh, The Pathology of Civilization. It was a really great series of essays. Um, and as you know, if you're a regular to the STOA, we invite um, kind of bold thinkers, original thinkers, eclectic thinkers that have distinct views of, of the world. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm very grateful for John to be here today. So how it's gonna go, um, John and I are gonna have an exchange for uh, 10, 20 minutes, um, kind of uh, get to know his worldview a little bit. And if you have any questions, pop them in the chat, uh, have a cue or question before you, uh, I'll call on you, you unmute yourself, you ask your question to John. Uh, if you don't wanna be on YouTube, because this will be on YouTube, just um, indicate on that chat and I'll read it on your behalf. So that being said, uh, I'll allow John to unmute himself. How's it going today, John? You, you gotta unmute yourself. Uh, oh, yeah, if you press unmute, there you go. Sorry, there we are. <laughs> Hi, Peter. How you doing? Good, good. So I thought um, i start uh, with uh, kind of an overview of your thought, because I, I think you read the, the culture war piece I sent you about mimetic tribes and stuff. And one of the themes here at the STOA is just holding complexity. And we had a lot of thinkers come in who have distinct views. Um, so I wonder if there is a John Zerzan 101 that you can give it. That might be a lot to ask, but uh, that's my first question for you. Well, I focused a lot on uh, what happens when a society is more and more technological, uh, because that's, that's at the heart of the whole civilization question. And I think we are now pretty clearly at the, at the point of seeing all these crises converge and put into question things at a civilizational level. And I think it's, uh, you know, that's the heart of it. And uh, the rest of it is, is kind of details. I think all of the previous civilizations we've seen have failed. And now there's really only one under the sign of technology and capital. There's one integrated totality in various cultures, but really only one world civilization now, and it's failing spectacularly in every single area, every level, every sphere. Name one that isn't going south. And uh, the point is, well, there are a lot of points to it, but I mean, fundamental, I think we could say uh, civilization is a parasite that consumes its host and then the subsequent uh, versions uh, seem in general to have a bigger purchase because you need a bigger host to consume. And finally we get to this one, which is all enveloping and there's nothing outside of it really. There's almost nothing outside of it. Uh, there's a few indigenous holdouts or something like that. But, uh, and uh, so I mean all these various efforts to to safeguard things, to reform things, to salvage something, they're really, they really mean nothing. They, they just, uh, that's why so many people have thrown in the towel. They had very, very weak solutions. They, they looked at things at anything but the required depth the needed to address the problem and they're gone. I mean, they're just uh, giving up like, you know, in all sorts of political types too, not just, uh, say environmentalists, but uh, you know, lots of other people too. It's just uh, game over, really. That's So you've got to, if you see it as a civilizational problem, then what is very difficult, obviously, is to ask the question, civilization, yes or no. It's hard to say no, even if you, <laughs> uh, even if and when you've decided that it is exactly the problem. 
That's, that's what causes all this, starting with domestication, starting with that epical shift to control. The control deepens and uh, broadens and, you know, it's just, it's, it's a continuum that's fairly easy to chart. I think Paul Shepard said it well when he was, he was sort of referring, the late anthropologist Paul Shepard referring to things like nanotechnology and a lot of, a lot of current high-tech things. He said, it's all there at the start. It's there in the first step. It's implicit in the first step, which is a step to domestication, to agriculture, to the domination of nature. And it feeds on itself. It's, it's a progression that I think is easy to spot, uh, easy to uh, track. And then you get to the place where the control is total. And that's not just in terms of science, it's obviously in terms of, say, surveillance. surveillance. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, the whole name of the game is control. How do you, how do you pursue that and uh, uh, make it stronger, make it more extensive? And, uh, and here we are, and here we are with everything uh, really failing and the, the technology part, let me just go back to that for a second. I think that's very central in so many ways, partly because political ideology used to have certain answers or claims or promises, the American dream or what have you. Well, that's, that's really, it's really worthless. It's, it's very few people believe in that stuff anymore. So I think the promises and claims that technology makes every day in all the huge ads and everything else have stepped into that vacuum. And now that's what is going to either help us or heal us or create a brave new future. And I say that with some irony. Uh, and, it, and it's very hard to believe, but I think that's what's happening. I mean, it's, in other words, it's hard to swallow given that we have more and more and more technology and things are getting worse and worse and worse for the individual, for society, for the physical environment, you name it. Anyway, I wanna, it could go on and on, but <laughs> give you some idea, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I wanna double click on the technology piece in a moment, but I was thinking uh, it'd be prudent to come to terms. Um, you, you had that label anarcho primitivist um, attached to you. And in your work, you have a dualism between uh, primitive and uh, civilized, where primitive is like, you know, non alienated, wild, uh, non hierarchical, while civilized is um, alienated, domesticated, uh, hierarchical. Uh, so I was wondering if you can kind of expand on that concept a little bit more on that, that dualism that you have in your work. Well, yeah, and I think you put it very well. That's, uh, that's, I would say that's an accurate way to put it in a thumbnail way. Well, it's, it's the idea that, in part, it's the idea that if the future isn't somehow primitive, there won't be a future. If we just keep going down this suicidal road, uh, th that's, that's the end of it. It really is. Uh, in terms of the human experience, in terms of, boy, civilization sure was great, wasn't it? Huh? Or, <laughs> or maybe it destroyed everything. It was just a path of ruin time after time, and now this time as well. So yeah, it's a, I mean, there are anarchists, uh, some, some of us who see rewilding as the course. And I think that goes along with the, the, the perspective of some native folks who see decolonization. I think the two can be fairly linked. I think some of us are pursuing that anyway, in, in a more, in a more real sense. Uh, or in a more uh, maybe down to earth sense, decolonization maybe is easier to uh, picture or, or think about or proceed with than rewilding. Because rewilding after all, that means de-domestication. We're all very domesticated. <clears throat> I certainly am. We can have these ideas about domestication, but shedding the domestication is quite another thing. I mean, I don't know if we're ever gonna do that. I don't know if we're ready at all to, to do that, to tackle that, but uh, that's, that's the way out of this, it seems to me, to refuse all these different uh, institutions and 
and values that have brought us to this uh, sorry place. So to circle back to the technology piece, uh, you're critical on technology, but also on what John Verveke would call psychotechnologies like uh, math or the concept of time um, that are uh, complicit in the destructiveness that civilization brings. Could you um, speak more on that? Well, in the 80s, I wrote what turned out to be a series of, I guess, five essays. I didn't think of it as a series at the beginning of it or anything, but uh, what are the categories or the dimensions of alienation? In other words, where does all this get started? And I was thinking about it in terms of uh, time, number, language, art, and agriculture. To, it's very speculative. I mean, some, some of the pieces more than others. The language one is very speculative, perhaps more, uh, more so than the others. But when do you start seeing this estrangement? In other words, for example, let's take the concept of number, not numbers, but number itself, if you can put it that way. Uh, where did that enter human existence? Where, where was the need to count things, to, to come up with that? Uh, category of thinking, uh, number. Uh, well, it's not too hard to see the connection. It doesn't mean it's totally evil or, uh, or horrible. I, I think it, it's the start of that, but uh, when do you need to count things? You know, that's, that's a certain stage of uh, society. And it's, it's eminently necessary with domestication with private property, with farming and all that, you've got, uh, you've got the commodity. And uh, whereas before, prior to domestication, hunter-gatherer life, banned society, egalitarian. Every anth anthropology 101 will tell you that. It was based on sharing. The fundamental ethos was sharing equality. That sounds like uh, made up by anarchists to make a point, but it's not, it's just, uh, it's really, uh, it's just a truism. Uh, and well, time, and here we are, just to mention that one as another example, we're totally colonized by time, uh, myself included. Uh, it stands over us as a materiality. Well, where did that, where did that get started? W where is the time consciousness? There are, we, we tend to think that uh, some societies, early, well, hunter-gatherer societies, didn't have a notion of time. Time didn't exist insofar as time is a consciousness of time, an objectified of uh, whatever it is. And, and no, one can quite die, no one can quite identify what that word means, time. Einstein said it's what a clock measures. Yes, but <laughs> what is it that's being measured? I mean, you know, he, he didn't he didn't want to get into that. I mean, because it's it's, it's uh, a little complicated. But that's you know these things start somewhere, and it it strikes me it's not a coincidence that the development of certain things, uh, well, is not a coincidence that they they grow uh, a pace. They they're related to a situation and a situation which is changing and they, it's a part of an adjustment to something and, and a way to make that something grow when it becomes the dominant order, when it becomes the, uh, the ruling paradigm, the ruling set of structures and all that, then it's, then it's very easy to see. You know, the in fact, I think time is, you could say time and alienation are the same thing. You can, you can chart one just like the other. Your time consciousness is a measure of, of your estrangement, your alienation. Anyway, that's the stuff. Uh, yeah, that I wrote that stuff in the eighties, and um, some some originality there, I guess. Uh, some have said I should have quit in the eighties because <laughs> I haven't come up with anything uh, very new since. But uh, uh, we're all trying to contribute, trying to contribute to this dialogue that which has to be transparent and honest if it is to be a dialogue. So we'll, we'll pivot into the chats in a moment. Uh, there's a bunch of questions being populated and I think we kind of fleshed out a good um, architecture of, of your, your views. Uh, 
when we were exchanging over email, you said you had some thoughts on uh, late stage civilization, our current situation. A lot of people are saying that we are in a meta crisis or an omni crisis. Um, so I'm curious, what is your thoughts on what is happening now? Well, yeah, I think that's quite accurate to put it that way. Those are, those are uh, words that have a certain ring. It sounds like uh, uh, it's kind of hard to miss, isn't it? It's, uh, do you think there's anybody out there that thinks they're going in a good direction fundamentally uh, or otherwise? I mean, it's, it's catastrophic and it seems like the pace of it is accelerating. You know, we 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 look at our grandkids, and I'm sure we're not the only ones that will wonder what kind of a world will they have in maybe even five years. I mean, uh, not to mention the the future, uh, more generally speaking. And you know, all these pathologies that maybe they speak to this uh, as loudly as anything since the late '90s, for example. Here in the U.S., the mass shootings, the school shootings, now there's church shootings, mall shootings, workplace shootings. You know, there's a, it's keep, it keeps getting worse, and it's even, it's even emerging more that the, if the pandemic is lessening or lightening up, I don't know if it is, but, you know, there's been certain return to school and work and so forth, uh, which may or may not obtain. It may not keep going that way, but th you come right back to the, the mass shootings, you know, out of nowhere. And, and it's, it's just a remarkably scary thing because it seems to me one of the most, um, one of the typical responses in the story about a shooting is something like, well, the guy never missed work. He never played his music loud. He was very polite and stuff. Then he went in there and killed 20 people. No history of mental illness, no criminal record, just snapped. That is pretty damn telling. And that isn't, that is, that's only one uh, little slice of it, of course. Now we got rising suicide rates. Uh, people are less and less healthy. Uh, the place is awash in the statistics about anxiety and depression. Even longevity rates have started to stall. It used to be a bottom line answer to some of our thinking, and people would say, well, yeah, that all that's interesting, but people have never lived longer. We live longer and longer. Well, that's not quite so true anymore. That, and if you count all the people, I mean, I'm not uh, saying we don't count them, but all the people that are totally dependent on the medical industry, taking half a dozen uh, drugs a day to stay alive, quality of life very, very poor. They're still living, but not compared to we used to be robust, we used to be healthy. And by the way, speaking of longevity, people used to say, well, yeah, but hunter-gatherer life, they were all dead by 30. Well, that's just not true. That's a comic book fiction, like a lot of other things about uh, the record of prehistory. So anyway, yeah, it's just, there isn't any part of it. And it's easy to see how interconnected or interdependent these things are. You could just read a newspaper once in a while and you could see it plainly. This is the age of pandemics. It's also the, you know, whatever. It's the age of mega storms. It's the age of uh, every kind of extreme, extreme weather and uh, so forth. I mean, it's, uh, it's getting worse and everybody knows it. All right. Um, so let's go to the Q and A. Uh, Anjan, you had uh, quite yet two questions. Um, the one on population, uh, uh, the reduction of population. Could you ask that one? Hey, John. Um, thanks for doing this Q&A. Um, reading um, the Unabomber Manifesto had a, was a big turning point in my life, um, growing up with technology and having to question what the water around me was for the first time. Um, I had two questions. I guess I could start with my first one. The carrying capacity of a hunter-gatherer lifestyle uh, would be significantly less than 7 billion people. Do you think there needs to be methods to reduce population to accomplish this way of living? How do you suppose this may happen? Well, one could imagine anyway uh, a possible reversal. I mean, it was domestication that started the huge uh, increase in population. Uh, it was, uh, at the beginning, it was 
in absolute numbers, it wasn't a lot, but, but uh, you know, in a percentage, it's just gigantic. It just leaped up. But the only other thing c comparable is the Industrial Revolution when the factory system got going. Like another great big spike in population. So if you remove those basic things that drive this, you would be going in a healthier direction because it isn't, it isn't a natural phenomenon. I mean, uh, Noam Chomsky, is, he's, uh, he's said to uh, us a few times, not to our face, but uh, he said, look, you primitivists are insane and genocidal. There's 7 billion people to feed. And, uh, and the question occurs to one, uh, Mr. Chomsky, why are there 7 billion people? How did that happen? What drove that? Come on, don't, don't, don't just, yeah, we know how many people there are and we don't want anyone to starve, but it's, that's the doing nothing about it, having more development because we've got more people, we need more development, more, more factories, uh, more everything, uh, more global warming, obviously. Uh, I mean, that's, that's nuts. That's what's nuts. That's just suicide. So I think, you know, it's, I'd, I'm not saying this would be easy to figure out uh, what parts of a process or a transition would be needed to bring down the numbers. Uh, but, you know, it's, that's got to be tackled. And I think that's, you, you can see where it comes from. So, well, take away those things. Take away domestication and industrialization, then we'd be on a healthy path, and I think including a healthier number of people on this planet. You have a follow up, Anjan? Um, it's it's a slightly different question, John. Um, I'm trying to understand the difference between technique and technology, um, and kind of Jacques Will. I'm curious if you can kind of explain your angle on it and kind of how it's influenced your work. I've been thinking a lot of, about the concept of Moloch. And so I'm curious if this distinction helps understand that. Well, I got to confess, <laughs> I've never understood that distinction. And you know, a little, I think maybe part of it, maybe I'm just trying to get off the hook here, but you know, it, uh, the technological society He's writing in this uh, rather abstract French style. They're, they're trained in this kind of classical uh, mode to, to the language, to writing. Uh, and it can be rather abstract. I mean, I, I'm, I've tried to figure out what, what's the difference. Would this technique sound uh, more, uh, I don't know, reputable or something? I, I don't know. But I think it's, you can break it down maybe. In fact, I think, you mentioned uh, in passing the Unabomber manifesto, so-called manifesto, Peter. You know that's nothing but that's nothing but Jacques Ellul put into more American or vernacular language. You don't have to puzzle over what his technique is. That some esoteric uh, definition he has that we don't know, or you know that. In fact, Kaczynski told me that. I mean, he said that was uh, that's kind of what it is. Industrial society in its future is the is the easy form of uh, the technological society. That's pretty much all it is. He added a, a few things, but uh, much easier to read. Cool. Um, Nick Benjamin, you had a question. Thank you, Peter. Hi, John. Hi there. I'll, I'll just read my question. Um, while life under late stage capitalism tends toward alienation, stress, the meaningless accumulation of wealth, moral bankruptcy, and a host of other ills, if we're honest, it remains the undisputed attractor of desire. Its libidinal pull has us all desiring our self-desecration, though most of us remain unaware. Where and how do you see us countering this architecture of compulsion with alternate attractors of desire that can shift humanity toward more beautiful futures? Oh, that's a good one. <clears throat> but it strikes me that in the 60s, we saw a little bit lessening of that. I remember a, a Marxist friend of mine said, uh, the hippie thing is just uh, a loss of commodity fetishism. Uh, <laughs> that's one way to put it. In other words, I don't think the, uh, 
the gravitational pull of that is so total as we might think. I mean, it's, um, of course, that's just a hopeful impulse, I guess. I mean, we, we don't really know if people can step outside of this. Hey John, uh, you, you see, you, when you walk outside, you see almost everybody from my generation, at least, walking around with their heads in their phones, these engines of compulsion that, that connect them to libidinal marketplaces where they can while away their time spending all their money and, and all their attention. Um, so, so we're all hooked, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, I know. It drives me crazy. I'm, I do some work over at the University of Oregon, or that is, I haunt the libraries there sometimes. And you see these kids, they're just like zombies, you know, they just run into you because they can't see anything else but the tiny screen. And you could project, they're going to get up, with maybe their phone is in their hands as they sleep, and they're going to plug it in right away, and then they go to work, or not everybody does that. There are people that actually work with their hands somewhere, but you know, and it's just a lifelong deal. But I don't know, you know, the, the I don't know what we would call it. Maybe it's the, uh, just just being so enveloped is a, is a condition that's somewhat imposed. In other words, I think there's a lot of, uh, well, I don't know if you'd call it evidence, but I've read a lot of stuff about how talking to these people, they're not in love with it. They're bored with it, but there's nothing else. You know, we've gotten to this stage of separation where, and it didn't happen overnight, but but that's what they're left with. And I, I don't know whether it would be, uh, and as you say, yeah, it's, it's hooked up to everything else. You know, you can chat with your family or you can order stuff or whatever. I mean, of course, that's what, if there wasn't any use value to it, it wouldn't exist. But, but it, I, but I'm not so sure that you know people are so enamored of it. I, I just don't know. I so hope otherwise, I'm just just to add to that. I'm riffing off a book written by a Lyotard, a French philosopher, called *Libidinal Economy*. I think *Libidinal Economy*, where he famously says that the the um, the a worker in the factories in, in the 19th century, uh, 19th century beginning of capitalism, um, rather of industrial capitalism, uh, inherently desired his own destruction, um, desired his own anonymizing alienation. And, uh, and so it's, it's actually not, it's not a question of being enamored. It's a question, it's, a, it's almost a question of masochism, of, of facing this this flow downhill towards complete and, and utter moral bankruptcy and, and alienation and somehow desiring that. Um, I, I don't quite know where this goes, but um, I don't think it's a question of being enamored by these, by these devices, but rather being just, just completely disarmed by them. Well, maybe that's typical of the uh, gloom and pessimism of today to come up with uh, an idea like that. For one thing, it overlooks the mammoth amount of struggle, the mammoth amount of resistance to industrialization. I've written a fair amount on that topic, and uh, it doesn't seem like they were just giddily uh, uh, going for it or uh, wanting that, wanting their life ways to be completely put to waste by the machine. Um, chapters in my book, uh, A People's History of uh, Civilization, uh, testifies to that, I think, or, or the classic work, a, a giant classic, as you probably know, uh, The Making of the English Working Class. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's just full of that. It's, for example, the famous handloom weavers in England uh, often would rather starve than go into the factories. I mean, there were just, uh, there were means, there were pressures, there were realities that to conquer these people and it took decades to do it. And uh, it was a bloody struggle, just like it was to achieve domestication. You know, people have said, well, if it was such a horrible thing, why did people take it, pick it up, uh, go for it? You know, why did they jump into farming? Well, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't exactly a free choice. There, were, there was so much resistance to it. I mean, it's, that's, the, that's the real story. You know, the cliche, uh, the 
victors write the history. Well, that's, yeah, that's, so we, that's kind of, uh, you know, it's overlooked quite a lot because they lost. So it doesn't mean they didn't fight back. All right. Um, we're going to go to Rachel Haywire's question next on art because I thought that would be a good one to piggyback off. Hi, how are you? Hi there. I am curious about art and how you view the primal expression related to art in conjunction with civilization. Has art been colonized? Have we lost our ability to primarily express ourselves creatively? Or is there some type of um, hope or like renaissance possible? Well, I hope there is with art, just like I hope there is with writing. I'm, I'm a writer, so, uh, but you know, I've, I've looked at this largely in terms of the, uh, what is called the sapient paradox. I just ran across this, although what, what this refers to, I've been, I've been thinking about for decades, really. And that is the question of the, how, why is symbolic culture so recent? It's practically just like seconds ago in terms of the whole sweep of the two million years of homo species, uh, there was no art. And about 35,000 years ago, which is, you know, blink of an eye, really, relatively, then we get cave art. We get the artifacts of, of symbolic uh, culture, which a little bit before it became a culture, but there was, there was the symbolic. You could see it in the, uh, not just the cave art, but anyway, at the same time, we know that people were able to do amazing uh, things, what we would call behaviorally human capacities, skills, over a million years ago, easily over a million years ago. So it wasn't that they weren't bright enough to come up with art, but somehow they didn't. I mean, it's so, um, so I've actually tended to see this as a kind of a, uh, compensation uh you you get art but you got to give up a lot to then have that dimension to have that the satisfaction of art uh but there may be a trade-off there and uh along the line somehow you've uh we've we've tended to uh lose the immediacy and and so many other things about uh pre-domesticated life that maybe didn't need art just like it didn't need number or, you know, these other things. I mean, people seem to be doing fine. I mean, I, we'll never know what their consciousness was, how they were feeling about it. Or, I mean, you know, it's kind of an implication that they were just totally happy to not have art, but well, we don't know that, but uh, you know what I mean? There, there were, there were things that were missing uh, and they were largely the bad things that were missing. So you can kind of make some conjectures about how, um, you know, people went along with, 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 without complex society, without domination of nature, without hierarchy and all this other stuff. So, uh, and you know, the archeologists have always puzzled over this. I, I'm not the only one, you know, well, why were they so stuck? They didn't change anything. They didn't improve anything. They weren't in, inventing the future or nothing, but and I don't know. It just, sometimes I just get back to the cliche. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, if, if it's fine, then <laughs> why jump off into something else, which quickly becomes not fine? Anyway, that's just part of the, you know, conjecture about it. Any follow-up question, uh, Rachel? Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you put it like that as art being just a, another modern invention, because I feel like a lot of artists have been trying to bring back this primitivism through art, you know, like as a, a vehicle to have a re-experiencing of the times that we have lost to civilization and kind of like the, this colonization of the force of life. Um, and I see art as um, like one of the few fields where, where people still do have um, more of that, that primal energy, um, you know, like just in terms of, of primal expression, right? Um, like the, the primal inner, you know, primitive soul in, in the human, right? Um, and I guess my question is, um, even though art is a modern invention that probably doesn't need to exist for people to thrive, um, is it possible within the modern context for art to leave uh, a primitive mark that could beckon people positively? 
Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, that's that's a good question. We're we're grappling with what we have, you know, with language, with art, with uh, you know, trying to add something to the uh, equation and uh, maybe find a way out of this. So, uh, yeah, music. I mean, these 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 areas. Uh, that's that's where we're at, and we're trying to do something with what we have. I haven't given up writing because I've raised some. Uh, check questions about language, you know, so it's, in fact, I have a somewhat infamous essay called uh, The Case Against Art, and it's not, it isn't The Case Against Art, I was just, you know, being provocative with the title, but it's more about origins of art. Uh, anyway, that's, yeah, that's a good question I think you raised. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, our resident uh, primitive artist. Um, Evan, you had a, a question. Hi, yeah, let me pull up the, at what I actually wrote. Um, so my, my question here is um, about the sort of concept of, of the extended phenotype. Um, so, you know, uh, beavers build dams, uh, wasps build nests. Um, lots of animals create things that aren't just their physical bodies um, as part of their nature. And when we talk about um, the sort of primitivism or the sort of return to these more um, hunter-gatherer or nomadic uh, pre-agricultural, pre-domestication societies, um, every one of those that I'm aware of that we have records of still developed something that we would consider technology. I mean, bows and arrows, spears, flint napping, et cetera. And, and so it seems like the seeds of technology are in humanity itself. And so I wonder, let's suppose that we were able to get rid of domestication and agriculture. Um, what are your thoughts about how we would prevent uh, the whole cycle from happening again? Or is it desirable? I assume it's desirable to prevent the whole cycle from happening again, but, but what are your thoughts on that basically? Well, to me, it's it's instructive to make the distinction between tools and technology. Tools, uh, especially tools that don't require a division of labor or a specialization, because when you get into uh, when you get into the division of labor, then then you have systems of technology pretty early on. Whereas if you have whereas a tool you know, you can see, you can see the values there or the potential values anyway, there, there, uh, there's an intimacy, there's a flexibility, there's an equality in terms of, again, simple tools. And those, you don't have those things. Uh, you have them less and less as, as things develop and, and you have the uh, complexity of, of technology. So I think you could say that everything is a technology, but it's 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 possible to to be more exact about the uh, definitions, I think, and that's where yeah the equality comes in. If if for example, if everybody's able to do roughly the same stuff, then one person isn't installed at a higher level or some effective level of control over anyone else because you know that's not needed. You you can uh, for example tools there's you know, there's some scholarship about that. There's no gender difference. Women or men uh, could make stone tools or, you know, it's, you, you don't have these incipient uh, gradations of power or authority that, uh, or the shaman. I mean, I, it's possible that the shaman was the first specialist and the shaman is not exactly a horrible figure, although there are, uh, certainly in the literature, you can find instances where the shaman is is really a cop it really uh wields his power over others and used it uh not necessarily in a wonderful spiritual way because it was there because the authority was there and maybe before it was a generalized condition people knew what that shaman knew but it ends up in the in the hands of fewer people and then you then you have a potential problem do you have a follow-up question or comment evan 
Um, yeah, so I, I, great answer. Um, so I see the distinction you're pointing to between tools and technologies. So my, 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 within that frame, my follow-up question would be something along the lines of, what are your suspicions about what caused the shift in some cultures? All cultures have tools, and it seems that only some cultures developed technology, and the sense you're speaking of agriculture, systems of domination, specialization, et cetera. What do you think is the key differentiating factor between the cultures that natively did and the cultures that natively didn't? Wow, that's a, that's a huge one. And I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you would agree it, it varies from place to place and uh, climactic and other factors. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's, that's one of these questions. I, I just don't know the answer. I mean, you, uh, like people have pointed out in, in Germany in the 30s, there was a little town or a village it was all pro-Hitler, pro-Nazi, and a couple of kilometers away, one that was not. And they seem to be the same. There's no big difference that's noticeable in terms of the political choice. So I don't know. I, I just, you kind of wonder what is it that, uh, that force, either forces people or draws people to do something different. I mean, it's not always, it isn't perhaps strictly, I mean, some people think it's the question of population. You got more mouths to feed, so then you got to start farming because that's a more reliable or possibly a more reliable means of feeding people. And then the other point of view is, which is more mine, that the population didn't start increasing until domestication set in, you know, so you're kind of, you're kind of putting the cart before the horse. But I think that's a, I think that's a difficult, uh, perhaps even existential question to some degree as to why it, it made easier progress in some places and others uh, just really did resist. All right, uh, Carlos, uh, you're up next. I don't think we can hear you, Carlos. I see you. Uh, oh, can, can you hear Wait. me now? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, sorry, I've been having some microphone issues. Uh, hi, John, I hope your uh, air quality is doing all right out there. Um, yeah, there we got way less smoke in this past several days, thanks. Uh, so my question is uh, in How to Change the Course of Human History by Graeber and Wengro, the, author, the authors present research that suggests uh, at some point in history, humans were flexible in terms of their social structures, switching between hunter-gatherer lifestyles and cities. Uh, do you think this sort of model would be a sort of transitional phase in rewilding? Well, I think there's got to be flexibility. There's got to be openness where it isn't so easy to uh, to ponder these things. Or maybe it is. I mean, I don't know. You would think maybe it is easier to see alternatives when what uh, obtains isn't working, you know. But, you know, in, I think historically it doesn't really work out that way. People become often more conservative when things are rough. For example, the U.S. in the 30s. That wasn't a very radical period, actually, and, mo and so many people thought it was the end of capitalism, but they still didn't, you know, didn't do a whole uh, bunch of radical things that we might have thought they would under those circumstances. You know, I have to say, and it's a sad thing that Graeber died last week at only 59, but he was trying, I, I think this is fair to say, he was trying to avoid the question of domestication he was trying to look at it differently and put something else in its place. And he was, he was trying to find places, for example, in prehistory that, that did have some domestication, but were uh, not so bad, you know, didn't have all the evils. And I'm not saying they can't be found. There's always exceptions to any rule, I think. But, uh, but I mean, that was his, he, he was pretty set on that, and I guess his friend Wingro as well. They didn't want to. They didn't want to agree with the primitivists, uh, to put it, you know, put it kind of uh, bluntly, I guess. And uh, there was a little bit of hostility on that front, which doesn't mean one is right and one is wrong. But uh, you, 
I think you have to read it as an effort to, it's, the problem isn't really domestication. And I don't think that's very sound. I mean, I, I don't think that's, uh, I don't know why he's trying to avoid that. But, uh, but again, I, I think that uh, if we're not able to, uh, you know, to, to address these things, to try to openly cope with what we're facing, then yeah, we got to have that. And I don't know where it comes from. I mean, it's, I see some hopeful signs, but you know, but it's a damn bleak picture at the same time. You know, we, I think we all know that. It's bleak for anarchists or anybody else. All right. Um, Scott, you're up. <clears throat> Thanks, Peter. Uh, John, um, just want to thank you for your work. I was influenced by you 20 years ago when my kids were uh, very, very young. And um, I was following a kind of a, a hunter-gatherer influenced uh, parenting style based on the continuum concept. And, and, uh, and I encountered your work and it was very resonant. Um, particularly in terms of like understanding the mindset difference to, to nurture. And then I tried to, to learn more about you. I was completely new to primitivism or didn't really know much about it, but I found an article about you um, stating that you were a, that you were living uh, with someone and taking care of their children. And I thought that was very interesting that, and I, I, met, I imagined that if I, somehow needed a nanny i would want you to be my kid's nanny wow oh thank you <laughs> so i was just wondering if you could comment on that experience of of being a nurturer of very young children and being in that position of to domesticate or not to domesticate and and what insights you got from that experience well the parents man it's it's i think it's a lot easier to write about these things than to enact them yeah in the 80s i, I sort of through a couple of friends that could no longer do that type of stuff. I kind of came into that temporarily and ended up uh, 80s and 90s, I guess, uh, doing a lot of that, really enjoying it. And also my time, at, if I could add this, uh, at the East Blair Housing Co-op in Eugene, where I was there for a uh, John, I'm just gonna jump in your, I don't know if you're touching your mic, but it keeps going in and out and we hear some oh. friction. Oh, sorry keep my hands off the thing. Thanks. Yeah, that was a, a somewhat similar experience. And uh, I learned a lot. I was living across the street in uh, a joint household. This was in the 80s, late 80s. And, uh, and an artist friend of mine said, well, you want to apply to the co-op, you know, and I, I lived across the street, but I didn't even know it was a co-op. Anyway, uh, I learned an awful lot of that. And there were a lot of single parents that co-op was, oh, 40, 50 adults uh, and then children, a lot of single parents, uh, single dads as well as single moms. And I, anyway, things, it was a self-managed thing. It went, you know, committees deciding stuff and people doing the work, the upkeep and so on. And I, one thing I discovered is how, and maybe I sort of knew this intellectually maybe, but I didn't really know it. I mean, the difference between the way women operate and the way men tend to operate was really instructive. I mean, it was just, it just seemed to me, and the other exceptions and everything, but just a healthier, let's get this done, rather than kind of jockeying for influence or, you know, competing with other guys or something. It was, uh, it was pretty noticeable. And, uh, but yeah, that, the, uh, the time with uh, taking care of kids, I had no money. And that, so it was a wonderful thing just on that level, but more than that, it was it was great. All right. Um, so this might be the last question, or we might have one more uh, after it. Uh, PDE, uh, if you yeah, can. Uh, Peter, I can say, um, sir, I'm just maybe as a natural bias tempted to take the the optimist position on civilization, um, and the optimist story. It has to be some version of, well, look, yes, civilization has like these really um, profound sources of unsustainability. You know, our, our population globally, climate change, um, maybe some questions about what we're doing with digital technology. Things certainly can't go on in their present form. 
Um, but you can also see like fairly, like these are really new problems and you can see some fairly large and, uh, and impressive efforts um, within the kind of weird systems that we have to try to tackle them. You know, global capitalism for all that, like it's late stage problems is trying to get carbon under control. Um, technologists are trying to figure out how to make digital technology that isn't terrible. We, like we haven't figured it out yet. Um, and so with that optimistic take and then the primitivist take, I guess the question that I'm drawn to is like, how do, what kind of methodology can we use to decide between these perspectives? Do you have a, a like a, a way you like to, to argue this out systematically with, with those of us who, who either say, yeah, we'll probably get through this or there's no other way but to get through it, right? Like civilization has to go through, not back. Well, I guess, uh, I guess one starts empirically. I mean, uh, are these things uh, uh, turning out? Are they, is, uh, is it a fruitful record of progress with these things? And <clears throat> I don't know where you can find uh, that it's all working out, just a little more technology, and that's going to be always here. And yet uh, the record, uh, not so sure it's showing that. It's, it seems to me it's deeper, deepening the problem. And, you know, I mean, we all want some relief. We all want uh, things to work and uh, not be uh, so uh, scary or making us more vulnerable. But, and part of it, or maybe a large part of it is, I mean, you keep reading about AI is marching forward and self-driving cars and everything else. And uh, maybe they'll, maybe they will work out the kinks to a lot of that, but you know, I think the bottom line is health. And it just seems to me, it is a sorry damn picture. I mean, I know, I have friends that are totally reliant on drugs to get through the day. I have, I have a very suicidal friend. Uh, this is somewhat new. You know, the severity of it is new. I mean, it's just, people are just, they're not in good health. It's the dis-ease of it all isn't just, it's not just a play on words, but the disease has to do with dis-ease and it's not, uh, there's something wrong with it. There's something that really doesn't satisfy, maybe can't satisfy on the level of technology, even though, well, and, and of course there's every different shade or gradient of of optimism and, and I'm glad somebody to bring up <laughs> to bring up the other point of view. But um I mean for example the transhumanists they're just giddy, we'll get to the singularity, there'll be so much technology, we'll reach the well the singularity and then suddenly bang, everything will be fine, we'll live forever, everything will be healed. Meanwhile, uh more and more of it, as I said, uh doesn't seem to be easing anything. It just really doesn't. I see, I was quoting on my weekly radio show the other night, uh, Citrix. And I never even heard of Citrix. I guess it's some giant networking uh, outfit, some high tech outfit. And they had a long full page ad and part of it read, imagine what we could be if technology pulled out all the stops. And I was just staggered by that. It isn't pulling out all the stops, <laughs> for one thing. Be all we can be. I mean, people are in sorry shape, man. It's just, I can't believe how this walking wounded, man. There's, and of course, there's tons and tons written on that. And, you know, you could say, well, these are the people that are, what are they, losers? Or what are they, they got a point to, a point to make or something. Well, no, the overwhelming weight of it from academe as well as from, journalists and the whole the whole thing there is no disputing the picture and i just don't think more and more of this is gonna is gonna be the solution uh, do you have a quick follow-up pd you're on mute i don't think i do i mean i feel it feels like a reasonable answer and you know, to, to, to then to try to get into the weeds on each of those directions, you know, are the mitigations for climate change working? Like, yes, to some degree, possibly way too slowly. Um, mental health, 
uh, I, I don't feel like I know the, the numbers well enough. Clearly you could make a case that there are like psychologically unhealthy things about contemporary Western societies. Um, uh, and, and maybe that turns out to be true, though it, it probably doesn't cause fundamental unsustainability. It's like something that's bad about them um, that we should try to fix. And then population, I think people have, you know, for, for 30 or 40 years have been saying, oh, it, it seems to be fine. And I'm, I'm really not sure that it's fine. Um, uh, but uh, that one looks like the big unaddressed crisis that that pro-civilizationists and, and primitivists will have to grapple with together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of moving parts. And, um, you know, I look for the upside. I look for the silver lining. Uh, I, I feel personally fine, you know, but that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean I'm unaware of, of the, what I would call the growing immiseration. Uh, and not just psychologically, but... Uh, but yeah, we have to grapple with all this somehow. And I'm just hoping that there's more ways to uh, open up the dialogue, you know, to have more of a conversation that includes more, you know, that's that's allowed, that's uh, that can be seen as, as permissible or respectable. And uh, I hope so before too much more time is uh, allowed to go by. All right. Um, so we're coming to the close. Uh, so, uh, John, any closing thoughts for us? Anything you'd like to leave us with? Oh, boy. Um, I know all these questions are coming at you from all these different directions, but that's sort of the, what happens at the STOA. Oh, yeah. No, it's great to have this, uh, be able to have this conversation. It's terrific. We just have to strive to get more of it and and I do think there there is some, there are not enough, I was expecting more, that there would be by this time more of an opening to be raising questions like these. And uh, I don't know if it's just happening a little bit, but uh, you know, I don't wanna be painting some over optimistic picture either. We'll, we'll just see. Uh, now, of course, here in the States, the the dominant media, the corporate media is about 100% all about the presidential election. And, and of course, rightly so about the pandemic, but it's, there's even less room at the moment to kind of step back and, and uh, you know, try to look at things more basically. Um, you know, I mean, because the whole thing is really, I mean, for example, voting, I mean, that's, Look, we all know, I think everybody here would agree, I'm guessing here, but uh, Trump is absolutely loathsome. Just a, a, you know, a despicable individual. And so people say, well, you gotta vote, you gotta vote, it's, it's between life and death. Well, it isn't, it's between death and death. They pick the other guy, it keeps on getting worse. It's not gonna save anything. I mean, he's, as a person, I, I'm sure he's, uh, more decent than Trump, for God's sake, but so what? I mean, you know, that's, you're letting it slip by. It's just, not, that's not gonna work. Anyway, that's, sorry to get off onto that. Cool, so uh, in a moment, I'll make some uh, announcements, but uh, John, thanks so much for coming to the STOA. We'd love to have you back. Um, Appreciate it, thank you. So we, we do have an event uh, coming up in a half hour, which you might be interested in, John. Uh, it's called, uh, how to be an anarchist. Uh, and my boy, Glenn Wallace is gonna speak. And Glenn, I think is in the, the audience right now. Uh, Glenn, if you wanna unmute yourself and kinda of plug what's coming up. Hi everybody, thanks so much. Uh, it was a pleasure listening to John. Anyone interested in contemporary anarchism uh, can't help but come across his work and bump into his name all the time. Uh, real pleasure. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about anarchism from uh, quite another, a different perspective uh, with John. Take today anyway, this kind of wide sweeping, large view of things. Uh, I'm gonna talk in terms of how we might actually start employing certain anarchist values and strategies uh, in our lives. Um, and I would love to have a conversation with, with you and I, I, would, I, I would love to get some of those questions and comments that John got and discuss them a little more. Uh, 
about a question about desire, I think, is a fascinating, important question, a question about art and so forth. So I hope, I hope some of you join us at eight. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Glenn. And then the link to RSVP to that directly is above. I post in the chat. Uh, we have tons of events coming up at the STOA. You can check it out, the STOA.ca. Um, your boy Chomsky is coming in, uh, John, <laughs> in the November. Um, so feel free to come to that one. And if you'd like to support us on Patreon while we uh, steal the culture, you can do that uh, by clicking um, the link there. That being said, everyone, hope to see you in a half hour. And thank you again for coming to the STOA. <laughs>